Like, dude, actually, fuck people who built an ad tech. Like, we're just trying to make our lives worse. <laughs> Bro went from like, one direction to the other. He went from, no, but I love ad tech. It's a great place to build a business. <laughs> <laughs> fuck it's anybody actually- who builds an ad tech. What's up, everybody? This is Michael Sakand. I'm joined by my co-founder, Simran Sandhu. He's also my former roommate, know a lot about the guy. And <laughs> we're here with our future podcast. Simi and I sold our media company to Morning Brew, and we got Aqua hired. So we're still on the ship, and they're letting us do a podcast. Thank God. But if you want us to keep it, please hit that subscribe button. Um, we need all that data, those numbers. We need to hit projections. We're part of a big corporation now. Um, and I'll let Simi tell you guys about uh, what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, so outside of our own stories, we're going to touch on another young gun who has built a tremendous company, ended up selling it to Lyft when he was 21 years old. And essentially what he did is he built an ad tech company. So you see those little like boards that go on top of Lyfts and taxis and Ubers. You see them everywhere now. He was one of the first people that did that. So ended up getting inspiration for that company by seeing what was happening overseas, brought it to America and made a lot of money doing it. Yeah. And we'll have other stories of ad tech companies too, because we can nerd out on this all day is like being in the media space, understanding ads very intimately. Um, you know, how these ad networks, like why the, the velocity for acquisition is so high as well. Like these things get bought up so much. And, you know, there's a good reason why Lyft bought it. But yeah, bro's part of the Aqua Hire gang. We know him well. We both <laughs> interviewed him on our show. I remember back when I had him on my podcast, uh, I remember like a few weeks later, like this was back when we were, before we worked together, you were like, oh shit, like that guy's so cool. And then you reached out to him too. So both me and Simi uh, ended up talking to this guy. Um, one funny story is he he started the company because he he uh, watched the social network. Um, and I remember being like young and being like, dude, how does it feel to like, you watch the social network and you actually sold like a company like in college. And he's like, dude, like, listen, like it wasn't all <laughs> it, it wasn't quite Facebook. Okay. Uh, I also don't think he stole the idea for anyone other than the, the people in Bangkok. Right. Like he stole it from the Thai. Yeah. The, the, I mean, what's what? cool is he took like a very D to C playbook. Right. And he was yeah. able to apply it to like this hardware, also software model to what he did. So yeah. essentially again, like, People were doing this overseas and he was like, you know what? The hardware already exists. I can take this and buy it off of Alibaba, kind of do some modifications, and then we can yeah. run that playbook here, right? So that was kind of the genius of it. He didn't reinvent the wheel. He just like took something that was working and then slightly tweaked it. Yeah, he's like, okay, like the rich hedge fund guy who gets in the taxi like on the Upper East Side, like, needs to, like it needs to say Ozempic. And then he's like, oh, when it's in the Bronx, like it needs to be like McDonald's or some shit, you know, like it needs to be targeted to, to the different groups. Um, but yeah, he made a industry that was just like paper, like you'd stick a paper card on top of the taxi. And then that would be like, there would be some flat rate maybe negotiated by one of those legacy yellow taxi operators. But he really brought it into the digital age uh, with the rise of Lyft and Uber. So no one had done this idea before. No one had put a connected kind of advertising play on top of these Lyft and Ubers because uh, they had only reached critical mass in the mid 2010s. They started the company in 2016, 2017. So he was like early. There was only other one other company working on it with him at the time. Um, and yeah, he was able to get the product from China, strap it on the top of these cars. I think he told me a story where he was at airports, like they'd go to airports and just like yeah. essentially just like you know, harass these Uber drivers trying to like, you know, sign them up, you know, usually it's like 120 pound, like chick outside a club giving Uber drivers a hard time. <laughs> like this time, this time it was Kanan Saleh, like a UPenn kid trying to like harass these guys. Uh, well, dude, it couldn't have been that up. bad. It, it couldn't have been that bad. I mean, it's kind of a win-win scenario. It's like literally put this board on the top of your car and you will make money from it. Like you yeah. don't have to do anything else. So it's not like requiring a lot of work on their end. I think they used to pay the driver a flat rate uh, and then they would make the skim off the top for like whatever the difference was in terms of the ad prices and like what the Uber driver was willing to accept. You know? Yeah. 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 You know, what's interesting about this is like how they got started in the first place. So 
you know, he's at Penn and he's just jamming out with his friend one day and they're talking about like how scary online advertising had become because it was like one of those things when, you know, you'd scroll a website and then you go to Facebook yeah. and then you would see that ad come up and it would be like, yo, this is crazy. Um, they were just like so inspired by that. And then they went outside one day, I guess. And they were like looking at like, this billboard banner and they're like dude this is so like 1980s like no one has really changed this um yeah. so that was kind of the idea it was like let's just apply tech to like these advertising mediums that really haven't been changed in decades yeah. or if at all so that was kind of the genius in this dude there's never been you know that quote it's like uh the best opportunities are hidden in plain sight or like whatever you're looking for is right in front of you there's totally. no better industry yeah. and business to like use that quote moniker in than ad tech or ad advertising networks like or outdoor ads. It's like, like literally this was like, how, like how do you just create this like canvas for people to look at? It's like, it was there. Like you just had yeah. to put a box yeah. on a car. Like there was all there, like the machinery of the ecosystem. They just needed to put the box on the car and develop relationships with advertisers. What I think is crazy. So yeah, he sold the company to Lyft within seven months. And it was definitely a super smart play by them because they got three kids who were super intelligent and who had figured out how to do this on their own. Like nobody Lyft was hiring was really going to be able to like spearhead this novel strategy out. Like I think they made a great play with that. Um, and they got them to work there for a while. And I think Kanan ended up like really growing that business. There's no numbers on like what Lyft makes from it, uh, to my knowledge, but Uber wants to uh, ride app advertising to be a billion dollar business by next year. Dude, it's uh, I think crazy. It Cause yeah. yeah, he was the head of Lyft media while he was there. I don't know if that's still his title or if he's still even at the company he or not, he, Yeah, he left. Um, he left. but that's kind of the secret, right? Like the best advertising companies are actually tech companies because you know, they can hyper target uh, specific consumers in a way that like traditional media publishers just can't. Right. So like, you're not going to see these newsletters or like big media companies get the kind of dollars that again, like not an apples to apples comparison, but like what an Uber is going to get or what an Amazon or some other big tech tech company will. Yeah. I mean, dude, like it all comes down to the fact that media companies don't really own the audience. And like, I know morning brew does like, you know, we're the shining knight, We're the white knight in this industry, but even just having someone's email address and their, their behaviors with your email isn't like as, that valuable to an advertiser like so with uber like there's some multifaceted market i know like on the top of the car is like a more general just brand marketing you know get the name out there type ad format but you know on uber's app they're now running ads and lyft is doing the same yeah and advertisers will be able to target riders based on location payment type are they paying with credit card or debit card fascinating is it a high value card or a low value card and then as well as their lifestyle are they a business traveler they go in the airport often there is such an amazing amount of data there. It's like so intimate. There's another company I found called Octopus Interactive. And like, if you've ever been hammered in the back of an Uber in New York City, you know, like there's yeah. some BS trivia will flash on screen. It's like, it'll show the Eiffel Tower. It'll be like, what country is this in? And it's like, <laughs> dude, like, and I'm like, oh shit. But it's trash. Anyways. The software is run by Octopus. So they put tablets in the back of the car. So they, I guess they pay the drivers to put their tablet in the back. And then they own that kind of tablet. Um, and then that was acquired by Verizon, uh, which I thought was super interesting and like a pretty That's big deal. That's crazy. How, how much did they pay for it? I don't know. Let me, let me try and figure it out. Octopus, Aquas, uh Interactive. I would assume mid eight figures. That seems to be that. like the going range for a lot of these ad tech companies. Um, well, I will say it's million. like hyper competitive though. Like they say like the advertising industry is expected to grow like quite significantly in the coming years. But dude, I don't know. I just feel like it's hard to really start an ad tech company. I think there's that story about um, who is it? The guys who started Invite Media. They like they they sold that company for like 80 mil to Google uh and like they had built it in two years and this was like in the early 2000s like it was a long time ago um but they were like yeah the one company we don't want to start again is an ad tech company really yeah 
And why is that? Because you're just saying it's hard to do. From from my perspective, what makes it so hard is you actually have to own the hardware for it to be valuable, right? Like you really need to own. So the thing is, is like these ad networks seem like a great upsell for companies like Uber, Lyft, United Airlines just rolled out a, uh, they want to start doing ads in their seat back, their screens on those. Like if flying wasn't already bad enough. Dude, if I'm watching a movie like and then it stops the movie. If it stops the movie to play an ad, I would be so pissed. You know, it's like a YouTube premium thing. It's like, here's a 30 second ad and you got to pay to get rid of the ad. I would be so mad. Dude, talk about a captive audience, bro. It's already Guantanamo (laughs) Bay Bay in the United (laughs) Flight. Like, uh, (laughs) I don't know. That's a plug. Yeah. Um, but, but so, but for United, like you, so we, you can't like access that audience. That's their seat back. It's their hardware. It's yeah. like with Octopus, it was their tablet. With Uber, it's their app. So it's really hard to develop your own distribution format, yep. right? Yep. Um, and you know, there's another company I want to mention in this topic called uh, Cooler Screens. And what they've done is they've built a fridge door with a digital LCD display. And it, it shows ads to people inside stores based on how far away from the door. So if you get close to the door, it shows like all the SKUs, like where they are on the shelf. And you can like, maybe even just click on nutrition information. And then if you're like more like six feet back, it'll just be like a full screen ad for like Reese's pieces. Right. That's Um, yeah. That's crazy. That company dude has, and these ad tech companies all raise crazy money. So um, (laughs) let's see this cooler screens company has raised a hundred million from Verizon and Microsoft. What? That's wild. I guess like if you go back and, and look at like Canon's company, um, because like the distribution piece is so key. The only people that could have bought that company is Lyft or Uber. Like they would have mm-hmm. had to collaborated with one of those two companies or they wouldn't have been able to scale it. So it was like, that's yeah. probably where they were handicapped to begin with. Um, and I think yeah. like the only other like way they could have approached it outside of M&A would have been like some kind of joint venture, right? Like outside of that, who else is going to let them put it on top of their cars, you know? Yeah. I mean, it was just so hard for them to acquire customers. Like it was just yeah. so much easier. Lyft knows all the drivers. Lyft can just push the feature to all their drivers. Um, so when it comes to like st- strategy around acquisitions, I think that one is like leaves no questions to be asked. Like it's very simple that they sold the company because they believed that that business belonged like with the rideshare company itself. Right. Those companies are historically hard to profit from and adding an advertising base onto that is just a a pure play profit driver. And that's why we're seeing all these other companies get into ads. Like Instacart's built a great ad network um, and they've really been able to boost product sales through their SEO system, right? So it's like whoever has the means of distribution can build a great ad business. I just think it's hard to get into it unless you're the first to build the method of distribution, which Canon did with the box. But I think to build an ad tech, you really do have to build that new tech that is going to house the ads. Right. Well, I think a great way to like validate any tech you go and build is like try to sell it at the same time. Right. So as you're building the product, try to go sell. And that's what these guys at, you know, Halo Cars did, which was Canon's company, um, is they essentially brought on this other guy. And I believe there were four co-founders when it was all said and done. Um, and he would sell ads at Google. Right. So he was like talking to all the big enterprises. And so he effectively became like their sales vehicle. Like he was out talking to all the big brands and they were trying to sell at the same time. And, you know, it was scrappy of them because they were trying to lock, they were trying to lock these ad deals um, before the product was even built. No one bought, like no one bit. And none of the big companies were like, yeah, we're we're not going to prepay this. But, you know, what we will do is we're willing to pilot this out. So they got some really, really big brands to be kind of like their testing partners. Um, And I thought that was like a great, good framework to think about, like, you know, building a business and actually validating the idea from. There's a great story where like Dave Portnoy would, uh, you know, call an advertiser for Barstool and be like, yo, like your competitor just put out a spot with me, like Dean Steakhouse, you know? Yeah. And then they're like, oh, wait, what? Like we need to spend as well. If you can get those big name brands, then just go to like the other companies. And it's like, okay, like everyone, you know, if, if Starbucks, Duncan, and Google are advertising on this car top box, like clearly it's like, we got to be on this game. Clearly there's some value to be found. Advertising format of car top ads is so great because there's no measurement needed. Like 
you're not really going to convert off those ads. It's literally just to like get a piece of the New York City skyline. You know what I mean? Well, no, I think it depends, right? So I think there's a few different ways you could probably measure it. So I would argue that some of like the most premium, you know, Fortune 500 companies may not necessarily care about like ad effectiveness as much, as much, right? Like if you think about Apple per se, like their big like mantra here is like they just want the most premium ad placements, right? Like that's what they care about most. They're not so worried about the ROI, like that is a gigantic business. And so they're not really measuring so- stuff. But I do think that like for your most average business, there's probably two ways you can look at it, right? So you can look at it from a pre and post model, right? So it is like, hey, we're going to do a campaign. Let's look at like website traffic. Let's look at app downloads. Let's look at like all of these common metrics. And then let's measure it after the campaign is done. And and then based on that, we can tell if something happened. And then that's one way I think you can do it. The other way is like through like direct targeting. So it's like, um, you may not necessarily be able to do this as much with like Apple's privacy rules and stuff. Um, but it would be like actually, you know, tracking like mobile IDs and stuff and seeing if like people are using specific apps and how long they're staying on it. And are they actually clicking yeah, and things yeah. like that? Yeah. I mean, what I meant to say is like outdoor ads are like, they're awesome because yes, you can measure them. There's not no way to measure them. I'm just saying they're awesome because they're harder to measure, right? Like brands will just pay for this outdoor exposure. It's like, oh, like, it's like there was a party. I was there. Nothing yeah. happened. Okay. Yeah, I didn't get any fair. numbers. I didn't get any girls numbers, but I was at that dope party. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't know what other analogy to use, but uh, it's just, maybe that's why they're so valuable. They raise so much money. It's just getting any kind of like mass physical real estate to show people shit is just super valuable it does help if it works though i mean in your neck of the woods what's like the famous story it's like brex right like they would just buy all of those billboards on like the side of the highway and actually worked for them like it actually was a key driver to growing that business dude that's a whole nother story in itself i feel like i should do a video on that i know there have been some epic silicon valley billboard wars like highway 101 when you go to San Francisco from Silicon Valley, you can either choose Highway 101 or 280. 280 is beautiful, no ads, goes by a beautiful <laughs> river. Uh, and then there's 101, which is like commercial, bullshit, like busy, ugly, and full of billboards. So it's cool to see like how Silicon Valley evolves. Because like in a recession or some shit, it's like immediately like you'll see like some white painted over the black, like yeah. how to blow up your company. It's like more like, how does cut costs or like how to save, how to increase revenue while cutting costs. It's like, Oh, like anytime the environment changes, just look at the Silicon Valley billboards as like a living representation of like how the Valley's thinking. I think you know, up. I'm a little surprised to hear you say that, like you don't prefer the one one Like, I feel like the, the way with all the ads and all the little like creative marketing would be the one that like actually appeals to you. Well, I have a BMW M2, so I'm really not trying to like watch any billboards. I'm trying to not die. You know, I'm just trying to stay with my eyes on the road. All right. Well, you're granted one subtle flex of the episode. So I think you just used it. <laughs> I might get a Tesla though. That was, if I get a Tesla, I'll just do autopilot and I'll try and study <laughs> creative marketing on the highway. Um, Anyhow. What, were you going to tell us about that Roblox story? I thought that was super interesting. Another a- advertising network. Yeah. So there's actually two. Um the, oh, let me talk about this one first, because I think this one connects well to what okay. Canon did at Halo. So there's this other company that started somewhat recently. They've raised $5 million, uh, but the company is called Agile Media Group. So they extended Canon's model. You know how he has like these digital boards that go on top of lifts. They essentially cover like these massive box trucks. So they will wrap the entire box truck with like an ad or a specific campaign that like, I think they just did one recently with uh, Mountain Dew, right? And so there are these massive trucks that are like going into the city and going out and you can actually track them, right? So they're tech enabled as well, but it's the same model. And apparently they're doing really, really well. I saw like one of the founders was recognized on the under 30 list this year, Um, but from what it seems like they're making a lot of money and it's literally the same exact model. They're just doing it with trucks. That's so smart. I feel like most trucks are just white. Like they're just like, there's nothing 
there's it's, yeah you know, it's wasted it's like, real estate it's like open white space literally i know i mean i feel like that's what building an ad network is it's just finding white space and shoving some bullshit down someone's throat like dude actually fuck people who built an ad tech like we're just trying to make our lives worse <laughs> Bro went from like, one direction to the other. He went from, no, but I, I love ad tech. It's a great place to build a business. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it's anybody actually, who builds an ad tech. It's actually it's such a douchey space though. It's like, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to sell you in something new. Like whenever I have the chance to, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, dude, I think if there were studies that like do ads make us happier or like more unhappy, like it would definitely be like, it's not as bad as like fossil fuels, but the ad tech people are like one step above. Dude, there's been so many of like variations of these, not even like the tech component, but we, do you remember those uh, people we met in Austin? They were literally like putting ads on the outside of water bottles and like it was free water. Oh and yeah, it dude, called free dude, water. That dude, dude, that dude, like he show, he goes to all these tech meetups and stuff and he's like, have water have water and everyone's like oh like okay thank you thank you for giving out the water and he's like well it's free and it's like well you handed it to me i know that but he's like no my entire business model is free water yeah and we're like oh right that guy that guy who's always <laughs> giving out water um <laughs> dude, that's so cloud, though. like <laughs> yeah trying to give you more it's like dude i've already had five and he's like dude, <laughs> you just need this on my water <laughs> that's so funny dude it i remember so when i was in college i was i remember when i was in college and someone had came up to me and they're like simmy i've come up with a revolutionary idea and i was like you know let's call him joe and i was like what's that joe and he's like you know pizza boxes right and i was like yes i know what people pizza boxes are he's like dude there are no ads on the outside of pizza boxes <laughs> He's just like, what if we wrapped a pizza box in like different kind of ads? And he's like, you know, there's all these mom and pop shop businesses. Wouldn't they love to see their business on top of like a pizza hut box? And I was like, I think he lost me. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think a single Silicon Valley founder wants their company on a fucking pizza box, dude. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd have it anywhere else, dude. Like not my target audience, dude. Pizza's out. Athletic Greens is in. <laughs> <laughs> athletic greens you know i caved and bought it right i actually really like it athletic greens what are you shelling out like 100 bucks for it i think it was like 70 dollars for the subscription oh that sounds I bad figured, i figured i made a video on their president i should uh i should get it but no it's a good part of my my morning routine but I, there's no ads on it which is great you know it's a refreshing it's really refreshing not to get ads uh, I will say their their ads crush. Like I know that business has scaled quite a bit because like their advertising team has just done a great job deviating a little bit. So these two guys in their early twenties, and they built the first ad tech platform within Roblox. So for people who don't know what Roblox is, it's essentially a virtual world where developers can come in and like make their own games and you can play it, right? So it's very like metaverse vibes is like the best way to describe this. It's probably what Zuck wanted to create and I'm surprised he didn't go buy this damn thing. Um, yeah. But what he noticed is like, there were millions of people using Roblox, but they were not monetizing really well. I think they were doing like 30 million revenue total. And that was like very under monetized. So the idea was like, Hey, you know, there's millions of people playing this playing this thing and they're on the platform. What if we gave developers the ability to make more money by letting them, you know, host ads within their games? Um, the big challenge they had though is that like no one wanted to spend money because they didn't know how to advertise within Roblox, right? Like because it was an entirely new platform to them. And it was like, okay, I understand that there are millions of people there, but there's not like any case studies that we can go back to on like oh. how this is actually going to yield results. So um, all of that to say, they ended up selling the business for $18 million. They found something that worked for them. Um, but also a genius idea. You've read up on them a little bit, haven't you? Well, yeah, I know a little bit about them. Do you know if like they're still advertising inside Roblox, if it's become a big industry or like Roblox maybe tried to stamp it out and focus on their own kind of monetization efforts for creators? No, no, no. So it is a really big uh, product for them. They're actually kind of in an aqua hire, situa aqua hire situation as well. 
Um, okay. I was the looking at like, love it. yeah, yeah. I was looking at their titles on LinkedIn. They're both like VP of Meta Metaverse, or they're they're both like VP of Metaverse. Um, that, but that like, title got significantly less cool. Like, <laughs> dude, if you were 2021 VP of Metaverse, dude, you would you could not you could not. You're you going into any A16Z party you want, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I've actually heard of a few uh, Roblox-based companies that have been acquired, like development studios. Apparently, there was one built by this like anonymous kid, and I can't remember what it was called, but I think it was sold for like $100 million. And it was just all these virtual worlds that he'd created and that people used, like 30 million people used. The problem yeah. with this space is like you and I can't really talk about these companies because it's like everyone's anonymous. Like the problem with gaming is like the same guy who's like crypto mail sixty nine on Discord is the same dude selling his Roblox company for a hundred million. So it's like yeah, either way, I'm not gonna figure out who he is. And like he's definitely not the type of guy to be public. So totally it's a shadowy. I community. will say these guys did a really good job in that like they weren't really salespeople, right? And that's, like, mostly what this game is. Like, you have to be able to, like, go talk to customers and go pitch them on something, right? And, like, be able to show the ROI. So what they essentially did is they outsourced all of the sales to this agency. And that agency was actually the company that ended up buying them because they were like, guys, you are on to something really, really big. Let us just take over all of the sales stuff. And, you know, for being two guys in their early 20s, like 20 mil for a bootstrap company, like that's yeah, a pretty good payday. I actually have another company that I want to tell you about uh, in, in the ad tech space. So uh, have you ever heard of Atmosphere TV? No. What do they do? So based in Austin, and they recently raised a 65 million Series D. So another very well capitalized ad tech company. What they've done is like they looked at that space of like the TVs playing in bars, restaurants, uh, barber shops, dentist's office. You know that little like shitty TV from like 2003 that is just like on a bracket up in the corner? Yeah, just chilling playing. in the corner. Yeah. 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 It's just like that is an old TV. Like it's probably not like able to connect to streaming services. You know what I mean? But they're always playing content on there just to like create the ambiance of their space. So they've created a, like a, a streaming channel for these like old ass brick and mortar TV uh, outlets. So they have like, they've licensed like funniest home video content, right? So then you'll be looking at it and it'll be like some fat guy like falling off a cliff like or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> like no audio, like no audio, no subtitles. And like back in the day, it was like newscasters. They'd have like the local news playing or something. And it's just like, no, like create viral, like visually retentive content for this kind of, you know, background type content playing. And I was like, that's so fucking smart. Like they probably have a huge audience that they can reach, but their model is like these businesses pay for the pay for it instead of cable. Dude, I don't know. I mean, like I see how that business can be gigantic, but that's just so much money to be raising for this kind of business. Like, I don't I know, know, right? Like, yeah, it's it's crazy. I actually thought Kanan had a really good piece of advice around raising money. Um, his big insight around this is that you should not raise money for a company unless it's the only limiting factor for your growth. So if it's one of those things where you have product market fit, and I guess in their situation, this is like something where it was comparable, where there was clear advertising demand. Drivers wanted to use the product, um, but the only issue was they needed more cars in the fleet before an advertiser was willing to spend the money, right? That's a clear sign that money is the only thing limited, limiting them from scaling up. Um, and I think that's where some of these ad tech companies have struggled is because they've been careless with money and they're just raising too much of it. Yeah, I mean, I think in Kanan's case, right, like raising a ton of money, like where could it have gotten him necessarily? I know he raised a few mil and they probably needed that just to fund the purchase orders of all the tech. But what would it, it probably would have just been like a nationwide sales force, right? Um, and I'm not sure like if sales is like- They would have also need- bought more cars in the fleet. That's what they needed. Oh, they would have bought vehicles and like owned that, like, that CapEx? Like- no, no, no. So I, I guess let me rephrase. 
they would have been able to buy more hardware to place on top of vehicles. But they're, I think their bottleneck was sales. And like, there's two-sided marketplace. You need to sign up drivers and get big advertisers. No, but the challenge is, is that when they would go to advertisers, they would like, listen, this is a great idea, but you only have a fleet of five cars, right? So like, they literally needed more money to put this hardware up on more drivers' cars. So they needed like right. a fleet of 100 cars or 1,000 okay, cars okay, okay. before it's worth yeah. an advertiser's time. Oh, yeah. So you're, yeah, you're saying with each sale requires X amount of hardware. Okay, that makes sense. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I think he made the right choice and he has a goaded story. He's been on a ton of podcasts. He's got a great personal brand. He's launching a new business now. Should be, should be successful. I don't know what his, I think it's still in stealth, but I think it's something around meal prep, which uh, I'm super into. So excited to see what he does with it. <laughs> We should also talk real quick about his exit and how that came about. So um, fun kind of story here. One day, I guess, like he's on LinkedIn and he decides to connect with like someone on the corp dev team at Lyft. Um, the, the guy at Lyft ends up reaching out to him and they're just like having a conversation. And I think just like time and time again, it was more of like, hey, let's do a partnership together. And they go down like that rabbit hole of like, trying to figure out a partnership and thinking about like the the investment required and then it came out to the same outcome as usual it's like why don't we just buy you guys like this sounds way easier like just come do this at lyft like win for us win for you let's make it happen and so yeah. that was kind of how it all came together i feel like not enough companies realize or maybe not enough founders either realize how good an aqua hire can be you know what i mean like it just for these bigger companies, if they can move quick on a group of founders who are revolutionizing an industry, that they'll benefit so much, you know? Um, that was kind of the case with Oculus and Facebook buying them, you know? Like a big part of it was that so they'd have this big sandbox to go and build out this VR future with. Like they needed to do that with a well-capitalized firm. And I guess the same went with Kanam with their physical, you know, their, for one, Lyft had a lot of cars in its fleet, but also... Like they owned cars, but also they just had access to this huge driver network. Totally. Well, folks, that wraps up another episode of Our Future Podcast. As always, Mike and I love doing this week after week. So catch us next week with another episode of Our Future Podcast. And please subscribe on YouTube and give us a rating wherever you listen to your podcast. As always, stay frosty. Go, go put some more ads in front of us. <laughs> <laughs>